pivoting in a perfumed world is the subject of this week's podcast. I am Melanie Jane and welcome to Scentcast. Have you ever dreamt of turning your perfume passion into a fully fledged fragrance empire? Maybe you've dabbled in perfumery, creating personal blends or indulging in the luxurious world of fragrances. But have you ever considered the endless possibilities that this world could hold for you? Today, I'm here to share my journey in the fascinating realm of fragrance, a path filled with pivots, exploration and the constant thrill of fresh starts. From humble beginnings crafting simple blends to designing fragrances for international brands, I'll unveil how this world can transform into a flourishing business venture. So if you're ready to unlock the potential of your passion and discover the secrets to building a fragrance empire, then buckle up and get ready to embark on this inspiring journey with me, Melanie Jane. So that's enough of the script. Now I just have bullet points and I'm going to talk to you about what I'm currently going through, which is a major rebranding. And the reason that I'm rebranding is because I teach my students how to pivot when it comes to things like so many businesses had to do during COVID. So many businesses, you know, were live businesses and they all had to pivot to go online. Many of them. I've known many people that have done it. Many that have failed, but it's something that we all need to learn to do. And especially in these really rapidly changing times and AI has changed the face of everything. So there was never really a website that I could use that could host all of my things, my perfumes, my online courses, my books, eBooks, all that kind of stuff uh, that I wanted. So I ended up having one website called bymelaniejane.com. Then I had another one called thescentacademy.com. And friends of mine, and even like, you know, people that were involved in branding would say, what, I don't understand you. It's very confusing your brand because you've got too many, two different websites. And I said, well, I had to have this one for my shop. And then I have to have this one for my online courses because there wasn't a site that I was comfortable with using and without paying astronomical amounts of money and then being basically, um, handcuffed to these sites because of all the work that you've put in and they're owning all of your material. So I had to, um, you know, have a look for different things and nothing suited my needs, absolutely nothing. And I'm paying a lot of money at the moment for the Scent Academy platform that I have my things on. And what I'm doing is now I found a platform, woohoo, I'm so excited, (laughs) that can host everything. And it's going to have my courses, my online courses that I'm actually going to completely condense because I found that a lot of people were coming to my website and not signing up because they got confused with perhaps I had too many things to offer. And when people have too many choices, like I've done it in supermarkets, when there's too many types of cereal or too many Oh, too many types of rosé wine. You know, which one do I choose? Um, And you end up not buying anything. Actually, I've never left a supermarket without a bottle of wine. But but you know what I mean? When you have too many choices, people get confused. So I wanted a website that could combine merchandise, uh, downloadable eBooks, a blog, because I'm so passionate about writing, uh, digital art, my perfume courses and a shop for my perfumes and merchandise. So I've now found a website that does exactly that and I'm now working on it and I have given myself a deadline for next Tuesday that it's going to be launched. So if in the next podcast next Tuesday I'm crying, um, you'll know, (laughs) and I'm throwing a tantrum, you'll know that it didn't quite work out for that week. But that's what I've given myself that goal. I always find if I set a deadline, then I really do my utmost to stick to it. But I want to talk to you about the beginning and where I actually started. Um, I started with studying aromatherapy. It was back in 97. I qualified in 98 and then I went on to study beauty. So I studied holistic therapy, which had a whole host of different uh, modules, including reflexology, diet and nutrition, 
aromatherapy was one of the biggest ones, sports massage, etc. And I was just creating really simple blends. And when you start with aromatherapy, they teach you, you know, that less is more. And to just start with creating a blend of no more than three oils and try to combine the top heart and base note. And we literally started with three drops of, in in aromatherapy, you don't really deal with weights like you do in perfumery. So it'd be three drops of the top notes, two drops of the heart note and one drop of the base note. And that's how we would start. And then we would modify it according to the, you know, the fragrance preference and how it actually smelled. So that's what I started doing. And I used to also, I studied uh, beauty. So I set up on my own in the UK and I started, um, you know, giving treatments and I would wax bikini lines and armpits and whole bodies sometimes. Goodness me. And I would also make blends. I would give reflexology treatments using essential oils and I would give aromatherapy massages and I would create bespoke blends for my clients. And a lot of my clients were going through certain things. Uh, that I would tailor make these blends for them and that's what I was doing and then I moved to Dubai and everything changed I couldn't get a job in the industry I was offered a ridiculously low wage that I literally could not live off and they would give me accommodation which was living in a dormitory with 10 people so I said no thank you I'd rather do something else so I ended up getting a job with Emirates Airlines (laughs) So aromatherapy was still there as my passion, but it wasn't something that I could do at the time. The beauty industry in Dubai, it pays notoriously badly and the hours are long, 10, 12 hour days, six days a week. um, And I'm nobody's fool. So I was nowhere, no chance I was going to do anything like that. And I actually was very lucky. I got a job with Emirates Airlines and I stayed there for about a year. Then cut a long story short, I ended up going into sales and HR And my boss was crazy. I was a HR manager and he fired me illegally. And one of the last things that you do with a HR manager who knows the labor law inside out is fire them illegally. But because he was a guy and I was a girl and he was from Iraq and I was from England and he thought that I was stupid. And because he could speak Arabic, he thought, you know, I would never do anything about it because when you go to the courts in Dubai, everything is in Arabic. Um, Anyway, cut a long story short, um, the experience was one that I would absolutely do again because it was a lot easier than I thought it would be. And they have a translator in court. I didn't have a lawyer because I hired a lawyer in the beginning who was useless. So I thought, you know what, I can do that better myself. So I did. And I represented myself in court and I won my case. And I vowed to my husband, I'm never, ever going to work again for anybody else. I am going to do my own thing. I mean, one thing is I don't like being told what to do. And I don't like following orders when I know that they're stupid. And I don't like going to work at nine till five, you know, when I know that I can do my work. Perhaps it might take me if I get my head stuck down, I might, you know, might might do a 10 hour day or eight hour day. But I know that sometimes I can do work in three hours. So why should I just sit there twiddling my thumbs when I finish my work? So I was like, no, I don't want to be confined to that kind of a life. So... Um, I said uh, to my friend who was an artist, what can I do? And he said, well, you know, what you should do is your passion. What is your passion? I said, well, of course, it's aromatherapy. He said, well, do it. So I spoke to my husband. He was very supportive. And I started a brand. And I decided to start creating products, but not just roller blends. So I started with Pulse Point roller blends. And because of my naturals and my skincare background, my beauty background, I got a beauty diploma. Um, I decided to make skincare products and body products using these beautiful blends that I knew that I was capable of creating. So there go, there you go. I went from studying aromatherapy, being cabin crew, being a HR manager, and then starting my own brand, which was called Nighting Oils. But then not just that, I had natural fragrances as well. And I was using just four ingredients in these natural fragrances because of my aromatherapy background and using naturals that are already really complex. So I didn't want them to, um, you know, be overpowering and to be too complicated. I wanted them to be simple. I wanted them to be feel good fragrances. So they were functional fragrances, um, which are a very, very hot topic at the moment. And they're really incredibly trending. Um, but back then when I was making them, nobody even really knew about what they were and any natural fragrances tended to smell quite medicinal. 
So that's what I did. I had my brand. I would sell them at local markets like the Wright Market, Arte Market, Christmas markets, you name it, school markets, festive markets, whatever. Um, And I was in some retail outlets as well. But then what started to happen is that, unfortunately, there's a lot of cheap people in Dubai that don't appreciate handmade products and quality ingredients. And a lot of them wanted stuff for free or they wanted it for very cheap and they wanted to bargain with me. And I'm like, I'm not a bargain basement. I'm not a, you know, a one dollar shop. So it really upset me. And then people started copying what I was doing. But when I would go and check out their products, like you always should do and check out your competitors, they were doing it really badly. And because I know my ingredients and because I know my materials and because I know my craft, I knew that they were creating bad things using actually fake oils. There was one of them and I'm like, that's not lavender. There's no way that's lavender. And I know where you've got that from. You've got that from the perfume souk who would swear by his grandmother's life that that was real lavender when it's never seen a flower in its life. So I got tired of the cheating. I got tired of the copying. There was about four or five people that started copying me and they actually started doing better than me because they were bullshitters. They were so good at marketing themselves and using real like strong arm sales techniques, which I found really icky. And I did not like that. I'm not going down that road. So I thought, you know what? I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to start teaching people how to make natural products, how to make natural skincare, and I will give them my recipes. And people will be like, well, why would you do that? I said, because I want to, because I want people to understand what is available out there, that they are capable of doing it themselves. Because if I can do it, anybody can do it. A woman with ADD, um, you know, that doesn't like reading instructions. (laughs) Um, So if I could do it, they can do it. And I wanted to teach them, but also I wanted to show them so that they would be able to understand the difference between a good product and a bad product. So even if they ended up not creating these things for their own use or for uh, commercial use and having their own brand, I was at least teaching them the, you know, the correct ingredients to use, the right way of doing it. And they could distinguish now when they go out onto the market and they smell certain products or use certain skincare things, then they could determine themselves through the knowledge that they gained from my classes of what's good and what's not quality versus nasty, cheap shite. So that's what I was doing. And I ended up doing that at a trade club and that was really very nice and then I thought you know what I want to start going into hotels and I looked at a couple of venues above a vintage shop that was a bit of a nightmare because people were going up there and looking at wedding dresses while my you know my students were like trying to make perfumes um, and it was a bit of a disaster so I swore never to do that location again I thought you know what I love the Ritz and I love afternoon tea and I love Prosecco. I'm going to start doing it in hotels. So I started at the Ritz Carlton and we had afternoon tea. I called it Perfume and Prosecco. It was a four hour afternoon masterclass and it was absolutely wonderful. I would either do morning or afternoon um, and yeah, people would come, they would have breakfast snacks on arrival. I would teach them about perfumery. They would go on to create their own fragrance and I would do obviously a presentation, they would get to smell the oils and they would get to make their own perfume to take home their own signature scent based on their own personality, which is what I would teach them in the class. So I absolutely loved it and people raved about it. They loved it. Then I decided to try out some different venues because the Ritz Carlton was very nice, but then it's right in the like JBR, Jumeirah Beach Residence Way near near Dubai Marina. I wanted to do it in a different locations that were maybe a bit more central in Dubai because one thing about Dubai is people don't like driving. They don't like traveling. So if there's something in the marina, only the people that are in the marina will go there. Uh, so if I did it like central, so for instance, Habtor Palace was on Sheikh Zayed Road and that was a fantastic venue. And the salesman manager there she was in charge of venues and events um, and she was just fantastic and she ended up being my friend and I got a great deal again it was perfume and prosecco people would come from all over and then I thought you know what do you know what I'm going to start doing now 
I'm going to go for what I'm doing, the Ritz Carlton. I'm doing Versace Hotel, I actually did as well. Um, and I wasn't just teaching perfumery, I was teaching skincare, so how to create your own skincare, and teaching people how to make their own aromatherapy products. So I had three different types of classes. So I was pivoting. I started with the skincare, I went on to aromatherapy, then I went on to fragrance, but also to refine my skills. I ended up going to grass, uh, to the Grass Institute of Perfumery, where I studied for a summer um, which would basically give me better skills for my perfume making and enhance the skills that I already have. Life-changing experience really opened up my eyes and I learned so much in such a short period of time. And I teach a lot of those principles today still. But I thought, you know what I want to do? What's the best hotel in the world? Maybe not the best hotel. They actually say the Ma- um, Mandarin Orient or is it all Orient? what's it called? The Mandarin Oriental in Bangkok is said to be the best hotel in the world, but I wasn't in Bangkok. But there's only one seven-star hotel in the world, and that's the Burj Al Arab. And I said to a friend of mine who had her own business too, doing face yoga, and I said, I think I'm going to go to the Burj Al Arab to do a masterclass. Oh, Melanie. She said, what are you going to do that for? She said, nobody's going to want to do that. She said, it's so high-end and You know, nobody, why would you do that? And when somebody tells me I can't do something, I'll go out of my way to prove them wrong. So that's exactly what I started to do. And I researched it. My husband was right behind me. It cost me a fortune. And I ended up doing a perfume masterclass at the Burj Al Arab, which ended up being from like 10 till almost five o'clock. So almost a full day, breakfast pastries on arrival. It was right on like the 52nd floor, fantastic views. The very first one that I had, I didn't make any money at all and had to beg people to come um, just like to fill up some seats. And that's what I started doing, actually, when I started at the Ritz-Carlton. I had to literally give away most of my classes and I invited PR people, bloggers, influencers and things like that. So my very first perfume event at the Ritz-Carlton, I actually lost money. And then people started to get to know me and I started getting some press and I hired a girl to do some PR for me on a three month contract. So I got in a lot of the local magazines and newspapers. I was even on the radio and the TV in Dubai. So that was a really amazing experience. The first Burj Al Arab event that I did, we had lunch in the restaurant, in the Divan restaurant, and we just got offered water. And the food, I think, was atrocious for a seven star restaurant. It was really awful. And I was just incredibly disappointed by that because I like things to be absolutely perfect at my events. I thought, well, I'm not giving up on it. So I spoke to the sales manager and the sales manager that I was dealing with at that time actually handed me over to another girl because he probably got fed up with my complaining. (laughs) things have to be perfect if people are paying hundreds of dollars to come to one of my events it has to be perfect so I ended up dealing with a Finnish girl who was really wonderful and I got a great deal and we ended up having a bespoke menu for people that were coming to the event and Um, It was just incredible. They had like breakfast pastries on arrival and then they had this gourmet lunch. There was wine, there was champagne, red wine, white wine and just gorgeous dishes like salmon on croutes and beef, Wellington or all kinds of things, beef and curry or pastries galore. It was stunning. You get the gist. I love talking about food. So needless to say, the next event that I had at the Burj Al Arab was incredibly more successful because I didn't have to beg people to come because people already knew about it. I already had the material. I hired a photographer to get some really high-end videos. I hired a videographer who ended up filming some part of the class, but I actually hired him to do... um, a demo of me with my scent studio because I had a little mini scent studio where people could make their own fragrances and then I would have videos to it but anyway that's another story I ended up stopping that because it was too much like hard work um but by having really high quality images by a professional you are able to really promote your brand to another level a completely other, rather than somebody just taking it on their phone and you know they're out of focus and you know somebody's hand is in the way so that was really a game changer having a videographer and having a professional photographer so I had enough fodder then 
for my social media. And I ended up doing four events all in all. People came from Thailand. One lady came from Thailand, actually, uh, with her translator. So she paid for him um, also to be with her in the class. Um, Another guy called Carlos came all the way from New York just for the weekend, just to come to one of my classes. People coming from Croatia, you know, Saudi Arabia. It was just Lithuania. You know, it was just amazing how many people would come and such a success. So, yeah, that showed the naysayers, didn't it? So that's another little tip to you. You know, when people say you can't do something, prove them wrong. But then I started to notice a shift and lots of people were like, I'm really interested in your masterclass, but I can't make it because you're in Dubai and I live a zillion miles away on the moon. So what can we do? Is there any way that you can like do live classes? I wasn't familiar with doing live classes. Everybody's doing it these days, but you know, that was, you know, back in the day in 2016 or something. Um, about eight years ago and I wasn't really used to it and I thought I'm not sure how good that's going to go down but let me look into the possibility of doing online courses so I did I looked at it I researched and I ended up doing the best thing that I could which was online courses for my perfumery course and people were crazy about it I told people that this is what's going to be happening so I gave people a heads up you know I'm working on this if you're interested then you can be on the wait list and you'll get a really good discount And it was amazing. Absolutely loved it. I ended up doing a certificate in natural perfumery, which people were really inspired by. And that way I could now have students from all over the world that could tune in to my live, not live classes, sorry, my recorded lectures. And they could do it as long as they had an internet connection. They could watch from anywhere. And it's a bit like Netflix, you know, they go on the video, they press play, you know, they can pause it, they can rewind it, they can fast forward it if they get bored with my rambling. (laughs) I don't ramble really. But yeah, so that was it. So that's when I started doing online courses. So you see the way that this journey is taking me from, you know, in a little town in, you know, Southeast England where nobody knew my name (laughs) to uh, creating little blends, you know, for, you know, private clients to now doing live classes. But that's not all. I took risks. And one of the risks that I took was doing the Burj Al Arab because it cost me a fortune and my husband actually lent me the money to be able to do it and I paid him back from the ticket sales so um, I kind of broke even on my first one which was good because I didn't lose like I did at the uh, Ritz Carlton but then on the next ones I made money because I knew how to price it better I knew that it was going to be better because the menu was going to be better. The course was going to be better because I'd learned a lot from the last time. So you learn things all the time. And the best way to learn things, I actually say as well, the best way to learn things is to teach. And the things that I've learned over the years by teaching has been phenomenal. And I never would have got that if I would have just stayed making fragrances for myself and for the local market. And because of that risk that I took, one day I was at a influencer event that drove me crazy because everybody in Dubai wanted to be an influencer. And I think there's like millions of them now going, especially from the UK, going over to Dubai and being an influencer. But back in the day, there were influencers, they would contact me and say, oh, I want you to like give me some free stuff so I can promote it on my Instagram. I'm like, how many followers have you got? And they're like, I've got 67. I'm like, yeah, no, I don't think so. I can come and buy some products if you want and give me a rave review, but I'm not giving stuff for free so you can share them to your 67 followers who's probably like all your family members. But at this influencer event where I was bored out of my mind because I was showcasing my courses and some of my perfumes and everybody just wanted free stuff, of course, because that's what these events are about is giving away free stuff and I'm not into that. Um, But I was there to promote my classes. I got a phone call. Uh, from a guy who said that he was working with, he was from a PR company and he was working with Carlsberg who are looking to launch a new perfume, not a new perfume, a new beer into the UAE market and they wanted to promote it to the bars and restaurants and offer them an incentive and they said they've done things before, little merchandise things as incentives, you know, buy a case of beer and you'll get this free thing but we've never done it with a fragrance before do you think it's something that you could do and would you be interested and I'm like hell yeah I packed up my table straight away and left I'm like screw this, I'm not doing this anymore (laughs) Um, so I ended up having a meeting with them and 
they said that this is what they wanted. They said they, only, they gave me a budget. They said how many bottles they wanted. It was purely promotional. It wasn't something that they were ever going to retail because I've had people calling, trying to call me out on YouTube going, she's a liar. She's never made a fragrance for Carlsberg because I've tried to find it. Well, it was never for sale. It was never in any shops. It was a promotional tool only, what I've just mentioned. So they gave me a budget which was incredibly small, but luckily I work with a fantastic perfume house in the UK and I work with a fantastic guy in the UAE that does filling. Uh, He does the conditioning, the diluting, the conditioning and the filling of the fragrance into bottles and he does the packaging. So I got the bottle, the cap, the printing, the boxes, everything, the design of the box and everything from him. Um, Actually, it didn't come in a box, but I did work with him on my Drama Queen, which did come in a box. But yeah, we ended up um, having this fragrance. I gave them three samples. They were like, "Mm, we're not too sure. It's a bit too strong. I'm like, I'm not losing this. I can't lose it. And I gave them one final sample and I gave it to them and they absolutely loved it. They fell in love with it. And even my students now, when I show it to them, they're like, oh my God, please, will you start selling this fragrance? Because we love it. So that's the fragrance that I created for Cronenberg 1664 Blanc beer and what a scoop that is you know working and making a fragrance for Carlsberg could things get any better for me oh yeah but just to conclude the story about Carlsberg something I forgot to touch on is the reason that this PR company found me is because I'd done an event at the Burj Al Arab The first thing he said to me is, I've seen that you've done some really cool things with your brand, like the events that you have at the Burj Al Arab, and we think that it'd be really cool to work with you. So there you go. Taking risks can lead to massive rewards if you do it right. And not long after uh, we released the Carlsberg perfume, I went to a promotional event where they were promoting that and the beer to basically industry people so bars bar owners bar uh, restaurant owners etc I got another phone call from an entertainment company who said Toyota are interested in working with you (laughs) oh my god I'm like what is this a wind-up no it wasn't a wind-up it was an entertainment company who were putting on an event for the launch of the Toyota Supra 2020. And they wanted me uh, to, in 2020, this was in 2019, they wanted me to do an event and they said, come to a meeting with the uh, PR company. So I said, PR and marketing company that are hosting, that are actually going to be managing the event. And I said, absolutely, coming, I'm going to be there. And they basically, in a nutshell, they said, what we've got is we're going to have and invite 100 VIPs, journalists and influencers to the launch of the car. We're going to have one event in Dubai, one in Abu Dhabi. And we are go- we've got like a chocolate tasting station. We've got another station doing this. We've obviously got events where they're going to be driving the car around the track. But then we want a perfume making event, like a station where people can come to the event, make a fragrance, but that make that, that fragrance will now be a memory. And this is the incredible thing about fragrances. The second that you smell something, it can take you back months, years, decades even, Um, and it can take you back to a specific time, person, place. And that's the incredible thing about fragrance and you remember things and you do remember events. So this was um, an ingenious thing on their part. I really was pleased that they understood how powerful perfume is when it comes to memory. And that's what they wanted people to do. But they wanted people to create a perfume in about five minutes. Because this event was only going to be a couple of hours long and I had to serve about 100 people. So I'm not going to go into the whole concept of everything and how I did it. But I managed to be able to create a concept for Toyota for this event whereby all of those people that came to the event would come to this station and create their own signature scent in a matter of minutes. Take it away in a bottle that had the Toyota emblem on and every time they smelt that fragrance that was linked to their own personality so it was their own signature scent they would smell it and they would remember that event and they would remember that brand 
that's how powerful. So that came from taking a risk at the Burj Al Arab, creating a fragrance for Carlsberg, and now working with Toyota. What happened after that? I did the Abu Dhabi one. That was absolutely amazing. But then... I got a phone call after the Carlsberg one from another PR company who wanted me to create a fragrance and do the same thing as what I did for Carlsberg for Martini. And they wanted me to create a fragrance for Martini Espresso. And I couldn't because I was leaving Dubai in about two days. And I was devastated. And uh, ever since then, I've kicked myself. So here's another tip for you. If you have an opportunity like that, a golden opportunity that might, will probably never come my way again, grab it with both hands and cling on to it. I could have stayed in Dubai, but I was just so adamant that I wanted to come to France, you know, and live in our home here and build a new life here that I was like, you know, screw Martini. <laughs> Seriously, I can't believe I ever did that. It was the worst thing, but that's not the worst mistake I've ever made. In November 2019, myself and my husband ended up moving with our two cats to our home that we'd already had for two years in France. And we decided to start a new life here. Everything just happened all at once. My trade license was coming up for renewal. My car registration up for renewal. Um, everything was coming up for renewal, it seemed. And even the rent of the apartment where we lived was coming up for renewal. And I actually wrote a little, not a vision board, but I wrote like a little like mind map type thing of all the things that I wanted to achieve. And one of them was, I don't want to do any more than 20 years in Dubai. I want to be living in France and I don't want to be living um, in Dubai any more than 20 years, but I don't want to be living in Dubai when I'm 50. So in 2019, I was 49. And all of these things happened. And my husband ended up leaving his job through many circumstances that you don't need to know. So, yeah, he was out of work. My business was coming to a close. And we just decided to just like, you know, grab it. This is the universe telling us that we need to leave and we need to go. But it never occurred to me until the day that we were leaving that I had been in Dubai for exactly almost to the day 20 years. I moved to Dubai in November 2019, sorry, 1999, like the Prince song, November 1999. And I left in November 2019. Unbelievable. I mean, how is that? So I don't know, maybe that's another little tip for you that you can take away. Create a little vision board or a little mind map of the things that you want to achieve and envision, envis oh, I can't say it, imagine it. So now I'm in France, we're still waiting for our furniture to come, but luckily we'd been renting our house before that, so we already had furniture, we're waiting for the furniture from Dubai to come, sitting there on the sofa, having a glass of wine one night, me and my husband watching some shite on YouTube, and I got a WhatsApp message from the entertainment company that hired me to do the Toyota event, and she said the... PR and marketing company that we worked with before want to hire you again for the same thing, the same concept as what you did for Toyota, but for Mercedes, <laughs> Mercedes Maybach, which is Mercedes. I didn't even know what that was. My husband's like, it's a supercar. It's like a super, super, supercar and a supercar by Mercedes. I mean, oh my God. So I was like, oh, yeah, okay, I'll do it. And she went, okay, this is the budget. And I said, okay. Um, I spoke to my husband about it. <laughs> and I said, um, I got back to her and I said, yes, I will do it. Absolutely, I want to do it. But the budget that you've given me, I'm also going to need my flights, return flights to Dubai and back to France and a hotel stay for around two to three days because I need to set up and I need to meet the people that I work with there and brief them on what it is that, you know, we're going to be doing. And about a week later, she got back to me and said, it's okay, they found somebody else that's in the region and that can do it for their budget. And I was so mad. But I was also, here's another tip, listen to your own instincts. Don't take the advice of anybody else. <laughs> I've never forgiven him. I hold it against him to this day. But, but I didn't have to listen. 
you know i've always been you know the um the master of my own ship as it were um but yeah i wish i would have just done it and even with the budget that they gave me i still would have made money but it doesn't matter even if i didn't make money and i would have broken even or even if i would have lost money it would have been an event that i would have done for mercedes maybach for god's sake so yeah that's one that's probably my biggest regret um in the world of business so again that's another little takeaway take away from that what you will <gasps> oh but don't make my mistake so now I'm in France. This is turning into a right saga, isn't it? Sometimes my Tuesday's tips and tales are only about 10 minutes long, but I think that people tend to like the longer ones. I'm not sure why. I know my friend Heather from H Makes Bags. Uh, she lives in Dubai and she's often sewing um, either inside her house in her studio or she is crocheting outside at the pool and... She loves listening to my longer ones, which is encouraging. And I actually get more downloads on my longer ones, which is weird. Anyway, I'm going to stop rambling about that and tell you now I'm in France. So November 2019, moved there, got that phone call, um, made that mistake, move on. Now it's March and it's the COVID, it's the pandemic and we're in lockdown. And I'm like planning to have my studio to open it up to people to let people come and have live classes I've got a separate building that my husband has renovated that I can't invite anybody to because of COVID <laughs> so what do I do now well thank goodness I have my online courses so I decided now to now everybody's doing things online I start adding to my portfolio of online courses then I started doing Udemy courses but then what happened is my competitors started doing the same thing. But I had one competitor particular in London who is quite a big brand um, in their own right, although they're still quite niche. But what they do, um, you know, they have lots of people working for them and they've got a good reputation um, in perfumery. Um, and they have a lot of perfumery materials because they have live classes in London. So they have a lot of perfume materials. So they probably obviously thought, oh, well, what are we going to do with those materials? Nobody's coming to our classes. I know we'll make an online course. And they ended up copying, I'm not kidding, all of my modules. Uh, they ended up copying some of the uh, things that I did, like when I talk about natural skincare and fragrances for natural skincare. Um, you know, they they did that and I was like devastated. But the thing that they offered that was better than me is A, they, they had a massive network that they could tap into, even though their courses were a lot costlier than mine because they had this big network of people because they'd been around for years. Um, they also had all of these materials that they could turn into a kit and I didn't have that. And France is one of the most expensive places to ship things from. And when you're shipping things, especially things like perfume materials, hazardous materials, it's an absolute nightmare paperwork wise, especially when it contains alcohol. So um, they started doing so much better than me. So now I'm like, what am I going to do? You know, my, my course sales started going down. Um, because I couldn't compete with them. I couldn't compete with their presence in the market, but I couldn't compete with the fact that they had materials and I didn't have anything to ship to anybody. And, you know, that was going to be so much hard work for me to be able to create something like that. But I'm not one to be, you know, outdone and I'm not one to basically give up. Um, so what I ended up doing is collaborating with a brand in the US called Perfumer's Apprentice. And I now have a kit called La, P La Petite Parfumerie. And it has 63 beautiful oils. It comes with a dilutant. It comes with scent strips and pipettes. You don't get the scales. Um, I was trying to get them to add the scales to the kit, but they were having problems sourcing really reliable ones because when you're looking for perfumery or jewellery scales, you need to look at German or Japanese one, not Chinese. Chinese ones are not very reliable. Um, so now I have this perfumery kit. So that's another way that that's why when you're looking at another thing that you can take away from this is that when you're looking at your competitors and you can see that they're doing things better than you, then what can you do? You might not be better than them, but, you know, at least you're, adding something to your offerings and to your portfolio. So now with my online courses, I have the 
kit, but also then I started putting my courses on Udemy. Udemy is a platform that basically rip you off. I get for any courses that sell for about $20, I get about $3 from each course that they sell. So I only have the beginner's perfume. It's an introduction to perfumery that I have on there. And I have a free essential masterclass on there. And I have a skincare course on there as well. And for me, it wasn't about using Udemy for the money, obviously. Um, It might buy my contact lenses for a month, you know, whatever income I get from them. But it was all about using them for mark from a marketing perspective because I've now got nearly five thousand people that have taken my courses off Udemy, which is way more than I could ever get on my own website because Udemy are shit hot when it comes to marketing, um, and they have millions of users that are online probably every day, so they do marketing um, emails like nobody's business. So people end up going there, even if they take my free course, because it's got a link to my website and my YouTube channel or my LinkedIn account, they go on there and they discover me. So I'm using that as a marketing platform. So always try to think outside the proverbial box when it comes to uh, marketing. It's not just about, you know, Facebook ads, Google ads, Instagram ads and things like that and paying, you know, to advertise in expensive publications. You can do something like I did with Udemy and use that as a marketing tool, which is why I do it. Because now when you type in what it is that I do, the Scent Academy uh, by Melanie Jane, it comes up as um, on the first page of Google. And I've never paid for a Google ad in my life. So that is priceless. So anyway, COVID's over. I'm now offering um, classes at my studio But I got into writing. And how did I do that? Mm, That's another story. I've always been a very keen writer. I'm very uh, lyrical with my writing and I love alliterations, as you might have noticed. And I have a friend who I met in Dubai through the World Trade Club. My friend Jane used to host events and this lady, she's called Rachel Hamilton. She writes children's books. She's written some real bestsellers and she's amazing. And she now has a literary agency. And I told her that I had an idea. I'd had an idea many years ago to write a children's book. And I told her what it was about. And she was really interested. Um, but I ended up paying her to do some consultation. And I learned a lot about writing an awful lot about grammar and where you put your commas and your colons and your semicolons and where to have paragraphs and how to make sentences more concise. It's unbelievable the things that I've learned. And I ended up never writing that children's book. I am determined to do it and I will one day. But what that brought me onto was then creating a book for students because what happened is now I'm pivoting again because what's happened is I've got my online courses I've got my live courses but not everybody can come to the studio not everybody can afford my online courses which you know a few hundred euros so how about I put all of that into a book and sell it and get an agent or did I I came up with a fantastic idea because I'm incredibly creative. And this is the problem when you've got ADD is that you come up with too many ideas and try to work on all of them all at once. I dedicated my time to my book that's now available on Amazon uh, called Fragrance is My Favourite F Word by Melanie J. Nightingale, which is an introduction to perfumery. But I didn't want it to be just any old perfume book. I wanted it to have QR codes in there and I wanted it to have I don't like stock images. I've never been a fan of stock images. Um, I think you can always tell when something is a bog standard stock image. So I got my friend, Anna Didcott, who is an artist in Dubai. She does beautiful henna style drawings, and illustrations. And I got, I commissioned her to create some illustrations for the book that would come with beautiful quotes. Um, you know, like one should wear perfume where one wants to be kissed by Coco Chanel and then she would do an illustration related to that with little hidden meanings. So it was making it interactive and all the answers were at the back of the book. I also uh, approached a lot of people in the industry and interviewed them. Mandy Aftel uh, being one of my biggest scoops. She's been in Forbes magazine, Harper's Bazaar and Vogue. And for her to agree to an interview and a very in-depth, I was on the phone to her for 90 minutes and it was an old-fashioned call landline 
not Zoom or anything like that. And I was um, allowed to record it and then gave her the transcript. But anyway, yeah, Mandy Aftel is in my book. Uh, she's a natural perfumer based in Berkeley, California, uh, dubbed the most prolific natural perfumer of our time and our generation. So, yeah, industry interviews, but also uh, in the introduction to perfumery, which was, of course, about the evolution, the history, uh, the fragrance triangle, fragrance families, the themes, etc. you name it. I had my secret recipes in there as well of my skincare. But each chapter had a QR code, and that QR code would link to a private video on YouTube that nobody else can watch. Um, that would give you the insight to actually those lessons, lessons that people pay for on my courses that are now inside a book with, you know, the flip of a QR code or the scan of a QR code, really. So, yeah, that was my book. And I wanted to then get an agent. So I set out, never done it before, researched, went on to the University of YouTube to research. And I approached 50 agents for my book, half of them in the UK, or maybe two thirds of them in the US and the rest in the UK. I got rejected by pretty much all of them. One of them based in the US, I follow her on YouTube and she is a literary agent called Jessica. And I know by their YouTube videos that they respond very quickly. Some literary agents can take months to respond and some never respond at all because they're just inundated and I don't blame them I used to be in recruitment and we would get millions of CVs and people would be like why have you not replied to me I'm like because your CV is rubbish and you're like you know you're a landscape architect not like you know a construction manager <laughs> it's two completely different things you know you're an accountant not you know um, a bartender so anyway um, I waffle about that sorry so I sent off my, when you are approaching a literary agent for a non-fiction book, a, you have to do it in a completely different way. If it's a fiction book, you have to send them the whole manuscript. But if it's non-fiction, you have to just outline the concept of what it is and give them some sample chapters. So I did that. I sent it to this woman in America and she got back to me. I'm not kidding. She got back to me in 40 minutes saying, I'm really interested send me because what you do is they have like this query system online where you can only give like a paragraph and an outline um but I already had what it is that they wanted ready to go in case she got back to me quickly which she did in 40 minutes and she said I'm really interested send me you know this um outline of your whole book sample chapters etc and I did I got ready to send it and I, my husband just came back and from the shops and I said go to the shop and get me a bottle of champagne right now because I've just got this interest from this literary agent I was so excited and I ended up sending her um what I had so far sample chapters and everything and within about another 40 minutes she got back to me actually it was the next day she got back to me and said yeah sorry it's not really my bag <laughs> I was devastated. Needless to say, I drank the champagne anyway, uh, because at least I got something from, you know, somebody. And then another agent actually contacted me and said, you're a really charming writer. I really like the way that you write. But unfortunately, perfumery is so incredibly niche that a publisher has to throw between ten to $30,000 at a book uh, to get published and they need to know that they're going to be getting their money back plus some and you know your fee as well so unfortunately there's no like real proof that you know they are ever going to get their money back because it's just too niche a market you could go down the aromatherapy route but that's a saturated market so you probably won't be, be successful so all in all 50 agents they all rejected me but I didn't let that stop me thank god for amazon self-publishing cut a long story short lots of tears and tantrums and people wasting my time and absolutely messing up my book uh, through really bad editing, um, which I ended up editing it myself. Um, yeah, I ended up, that was it. I got it published on Amazon and it's now available on there. And I am very proud of myself and people that buy it absolutely love it. And especially students that have actually done my course buy the book as well, because they said it's actually a really good summary of the whole diploma course of 
you know natural perfumery so they don't even have to like really when they're doing the course make notes because the whole summary of the course is in that book so yeah if you're interested in learning about perfumery then you can go and buy my book um and talking about pivoting I am now in the middle of writing another one. I'm using the same friend, uh, Anna Didcot, artist, who is going to do, well, she's actually done them, um, all the illustrations for me. And the book is going to be an A to Z of perfumery materials, focusing on the naturals, of course, because there's much less of them than there are synthetics and aromachemicals. Um, what are synthetics and aromachemicals? Um, you can go into my Fragrance 101 course and learn about that. But synthetics and aromachemicals are basically the same thing, but they're not naturals. That's it. The clue is in the name. But yeah, this is the book that I am now almost going to. I'm halfway through it and I've got still a lot of work. I'm definitely going to be doing the children's book as well. But also now because of artificial intelligence, I was having a little play around with it and I decided to do some artwork. So now I've got digital artwork, which is really incredible. And I'm going to be putting that on my new website. I'm going to be putting some of it onto merchandise as well, which will be print on demand so that people can have either digital downloads or they can have things like... um, cushion covers, bags, prints. I'll probably just focus on the prints actually and maybe mugs. Everybody likes a good mug, makes a good gift, but prints and uh, canvases, but as well as digital downloads. So, and the uh, and the artwork has got everything to do with fragrance. So it's all fragrance related. It's all, everything that I do is all intrinsically linked. Um, and I now have a new fragrance that I believe it or not, I've actually been working on for the last like six years and I'm going to collect that when I go to the UK later this month because I'm collaborated with a perfume house. It's my formula. I gave it to them and they're producing it for me, which is what I teach my students in my private label perfume mastery class to, um, if they want to be commercially successful, then, you know, one of the best ways is to collaborate with a perfume house because that's the only way that you can really, really scale a business is to get it made by a big manufacturer. Um, so yeah, I'm embracing you know, new technologies, new websites. Uh, on this new website, I'll be able to host everything that I've just mentioned so far, plus my perfumes, but they're not going to be any ordinary perfumes. I mean, come on, this is me we're talking about. Melanie Jane, drama queen, extraordinaire, <laughs> fragrance fairy. Uh, they are going to be in vintage pill boxes. And this is how I'm going to do the soft launch. I go to flea markets in France and, you know, this is another thing that I found from there. How amazing the world that the the way the universe works, taking me to all of these fragrance uh, flea markets. There, you find perfume bottles. That's another story. If you've seen my studio, my pictures on my social media, I have now one thousand two hundred more, actually more than that now, perfume bottles, vintage, ancient, really antique ones, very highly collectible. Some made by the the bottles are made by Lalique or Baccarat. Uh, very old. I started concentrating now on on specific brands like Chanel, Hermes, Guerlain, Dior, uh, etc. And even Avon, Avon, but only the ones where they're very collectible. You know, they're shaped like dogs or like you know a pipe or a snowman <laughs> or something. So yeah, that's another way that I've pivoted because I've moved to France and you in Dubai they don't have flea markets where they have like you know you're able to collect so many perfume bottles. I met a guy at an antique market called Andre who has more than thirteen thousand and materials related to fragrance whether it be memorabilia magazines books posters perfume bottles compacts uh, little things like that jewelry um, and I met him and he's now like my dealer he's like my drug dealer but in perfume and I get some really rare things from him I've recently acquired a lot of very old magazines some of them over a hundred years old in really good condition they're in French I've got some in English as well um and it's yeah I, it's just amazing the world the way that the universe takes you you know and the way that the world takes you and the way that this industry can take you it's not just about making perfumes and starting your own fragrance brand and trying to sell them and fail you know it's about pivoting and learning from your mistakes learning from hard times learning from any perhaps mistakes that you make or learning from the things that you actually really 
don't like doing um and but it takes you into a completely different direction so now i have a my sense studio is like a museum so when people come i've got over a hundred books a lot of really rare old perfumery books and people can come to my studio and not just make fragrances but be privy to this world of fragrance through these flacons and books that i have that is dedicated to perfumery but back quickly to the flea market. So there I started collecting pill boxes. And then I thought, you know what I'm going to do? I used to make solid perfumes when I was in Dubai. I did it many, many years ago alongside the um, atomizer spray perfumes. And people love the solid perfumes because A, it's not it's a liquid so it won't spill. A, you can travel with it because it's a, not a liquid. Uh, they come in tiny little things. So you can put them in your pocket or your purse, you know, your little clutch bag or whatever. Um, and it's a really beautiful, interesting, um, very personal way of applying a perfume, you know, when you're applying it with your fingers to your own skin rather than just spraying it. It's a lot more personal. So um, I, I just used to sell them in regular containers, but now I'm privy to this world of flea markets in France. So now I've got beautiful vintage porcelain pill boxes, silver, Italian silver vintage pill boxes. And that is where my perfume is going to be inside these beautiful things wrapped with a beautiful silk or satin scarf that I also find at flea markets. Uh, with a little handwritten note and they're going to be so unique because obviously the pill boxes are really one of a kind um they weren't at the time but really they are really quite rare finds now so that's why and I like it to be individual I love being an individual uh, I'm incredibly eccentric I remember when I first moved here the way that I dress I love dressing up um, and in France, a lot of people don't like dressing up. People associate France with Paris and Paris, you know, the city of fashion. Uh, but it's really not like that at all. And people tend to dress down and wear sweatpants and wear a lot of grey. Well, I'm not like that. I'm an incredibly colourful character. I love being eccentric. Um, and I love dressing up and wearing jewellery and lovely shoes and gorgeous dresses and being really flamboyant. And... Um, I just love dressing like that. And my friend Eric said, don't worry, Melanie, you'll soon, you know, get to the French way of, you know, dressing down and going to the shops in your sweatpants. I'm like, I'm never going to be that. I'm never going to go there and I'm never going to do that. And I get stared at when I go to flea markets, but for the right reasons. I think people think maybe they get inspired by the fact that I genuinely don't give a shit what people think about me you know, and if they're going to stare, then good, you know, some people might think I look a bit weird, but you know, so what, I don't care, I'm never going to see them again, that's not my problem, um, and I wear what the hell I want, because life is too short to not do that, so I wear beautiful things, and lots of people actually really, they stop me, and compliment me, and go, god, you look really amazing, I went to one a few days ago, I was wearing this yellow dress, and it was just like bright yellow, you know, off the shoulder, right to my ankle, gorgeous dress, you know, it makes me look huge, I look like a big banana, but you know, people were like, oh, you look so fabulous, you look so amazing, you know, and I turned heads, you know what, I like to be the centre of attention, so what? To conclude this episode, the world of perfumery, as you have heard, is a kaleidoscope of endless possibilities. And it's not just about creating beautiful scents, it's about embracing innovation exploring uncharted territories and transforming your passion into a thriving empire. And as I've just shared now, my journey has been a whirlwind of pivots, new skills, exciting adventures. And you need to remember this, the only limit is your own imagination. So please, with both feet, dive into this world even though you actually dive with your hands. Embrace the opportunities that present themselves and don't be afraid to chart your own course. With dedication and a touch of entrepreneurial spirit, you too can turn your passion for perfumery into a fragrant success story. I really hope that I have inspired you in this episode. I've inspired myself. <laughs> But more than anything, it's five o'clock and I've inspired myself to go and make the chicken curry that I promised my hardworking husband I would make for him. And I've not even made the bread yet. Yes, I make my own nan bread. 
and I'm obsessed with curry. So um, on that note, thank you for joining me on this exploration of scents and endless possibilities. Until next time, stay fabulous. Bientôt!